Transvision 2022, organisé par l'Association française transhumaniste. Hey, uh, yeah, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm the President and Chief Science Officer of the Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation, which is a new organization that I created in the past couple of months. Um, uh, we have a variety of activities that are really focused on taking rejuvenation to the next level, uh, into the point where we can genuinely reach longevity escape velocity and, um, postpone the health problems of late life far enough that we have time to postpone them the next chunk and so on um that in our current initial project consists of three main activities one is to achieve robust mouse rejuvenation uh which is basically the extension by at least a year of the lifespan and of course the healthy lifespan of mice using a panel of uh, interventions that are only initiated in middle age Um, another is we're doing a, a couple of projects in the cryonics space, um, we're trying to improve the quality of cryopreservation. And those two projects are both um, headed by people who used to work for me at Science Research Foundation and who have uh, great interest in this area. And the third thing that we're doing a lot of, a lot more than I've done in the past, is advocacy at various levels, both at the political level, especially in the USA, and also at the social level, trying to essentially be an antidote to the AARP. Um, and again, we, have, we work closely with other organizations that that we are funding to, uh, to push those things forward. So those are the main things we're doing. Um, I better stop there, really. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I've already uh, explained uh, what we are doing at TEFS, but specifically to, to Afro Longevity, as I said, advocacy is one of the key things that <clears throat> we're going to be focusing on, but uh, not forgetting that there's still research that still needs to be done across the African continent, a little bit Afrocentric. Um, and also to promote literature um, uh, around uh, science and especially research uh, literature. So we've got a journal uh, that has been in existence for the past five years and we are inviting uh, scientists, academics, so scholars to publish uh, their research there. The problem that we've seen in Africa is that we've got a lot of uh, scholars that have got uh, papers just sitting Uh, gathering dust because one they cannot afford to publish because it's a bit uh, pricey so we've made this journal uh, available for free um, so we would invite especially young people to uh, you know um, come reach uh, reach out to us and you know um, come and publish their papers there we also have a global magazine that really really uh, focuses on you know Uh, longevity holistically uh, so if uh, you've got an article that you would like um, to publish there as well we are inviting you to do that and uh, TEFS as an organization is transdisciplinary so we are looking at uh, the influence of science and technology across all disciplines so we really would like to have approaches that will talk to every sector of the society at all different stages. And um, we are hoping that uh, we can collaborate with a lot more people uh, to be able to, to do that. And just one thing that uh, I also want to mention is that as far as young people are concerned, which is something that we've really uh, realized is that we do not have enough young people participating in the longevity movement and we would like to encourage that. And um, in, in uh, as part of Afro Longevity Advocacy Movement, we are launching a, comp a competition from next month, which will run for six months leading up to our conference uh, that is happening in August. We will have young people putting through their uh, proposals in terms of what do they think about longevity? What do they think the barriers or challenges might be and if they can propose solutions for that and um, yeah that's some of the things we're doing. So I'm the chairman of a single issue longevity party in, in Germany basically and we do advocacy for longevity um, so we promote um, the damage uh, 
repair approach um, because uh, most most or a lot of people don't know about the, the repair the damage of a repair approach yet, and we think it is essential uh, for longevity or for for the enthusiasm for longevity that people know about it. Um, so. Our party name is, is uh, really self-explanatory. We are a single issue party. So uh, by we already participated, as I said, in 18 elections. So prior to election, in the election campaign, people hear about our party. They see us on the ballot paper. And then um, a lot of people like go to our website and see what we are about. And on our website, we explain all the damage repair approach and we have a lot of links to to other explanatory sites like fight aging or lifespan io and so and um yeah this way we do advocacy and for example in uh, prior elections uh, we hang up election posters with a photo of Aubrey de gray already uh, many times um because uh, of course he came up with the damage repair approach so if people Google uh, his name, they will, will find out uh, all about this. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we do. Thank you, uh, Felix O'Brien and Brenda. Uh, so, um, I will uh, give you uh, four questions and I ask you to answer uh, by yes, gl uh, no, globally, yes, globally, uh, no. And then, uh, yeah, uh, to answer a little bit more if you want. Because we, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic we will have a lot of time, I think, for, uh, also for questions from the, from the room. And this is the also always the most important thing. Uh, so my, the first question is my conviction is that uh, uh, we have more than enough uh, health data. We have also more than enough uh, uh, scientific, uh, uh, new scientific uh, articles to progress a lot for longevity. But we are not uh, uh, able to share them for many, many uh, reasons. Uh, in, in Europe, it's especially uh, GDPR aspects. Uh, in US, it's especially uh, patent uh, aspects and so on. Um, so, uh, do you agree? Yes, no, globally, and so. And um, and what would you do if you globally agree to uh, progress in this direction to share more uh, health data and scientific articles? Um, so, I will say yes. There's a lot of data, and it's not being shared. Um, at least, not as much as, as it should. Um, so I think it boils down to the data governance uh, policies and laws across the globe. And in my view, it is really limiting. Um, the more we share, the more we can do from a scientific point of view, and the more we can uh, be able to advocate more for, for longevity, showing examples of what has been found or what has been achieved across the globe. So I think we need to start... Uh, and that is why I talk about education being very important. I think if we start to influence the lawmakers, the policymakers, to ensure that their laws are flexible enough to prioritize the things that are important in specific country and also ensure that several laws that uh, govern data, you know, are, 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 are are protective, but at the same time, agile and flexible enough to allow some of these things to happen. If you look at GDPR, there are aspects of GDPR that are very restrictive, but there are elements there that you can still, you know, um, work around. In South Africa, for example, we've got what we call Protection of Personal Information Act. It is a law that was enacted, I think, in 2011, but it looks, it's similar to GDPR. But when you look at it, the enforcement of that, you know, it's not as hard. And um, I, I will say this uh, for most African countries, because they are, they, they are very small democracies that are still trying to develop and trying to find opportunities for economic growth. Uh, looking at science and technology as one, you find that the laws are not as spaghetti and entrenched as with developed countries. So there's still room to really um, influence how they are applied and how they are formed. Yeah, um, 
I certainly say yes to your question. Uh, there's definitely a need for much more data sharing in order to get more done with a larger, larger amount of data. Um, I agree with very much with what Brenda said that uh, there are certain parts of the world, perhaps especially Africa, uh, in which we may be able to do more uh, already with the current situation. Uh, but, of course, the difficulty is that the actual amount of data that's present in Africa is significantly less because the organization that have um, gathered most of this data are in the West, in the industrialized world. Now, um, as you said, Didier, there are two main types of problem here. One is the commercial side of things, um, where people, well, where companies don't want to share data, and the other is the legal side of things, where there are restrictions based on privacy considerations. For the commercial side of things, of course, you know, as with anything commercial, that problem can be addressed to a significant extent by throwing money at it. And um, I think that's in that th there's a good chance that that's actually going to happen. The people who are throwing money at the longevity mission in general at the moment um, are, pe are the kind of people who understand the value of big data and the potential to actually um, make progress by uh, unearthing data that's currently uh, less available. And so, you know, that's the direction that I would be encouraging to, 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 to you know, to urge and to, to incentivize those who are spending significant amounts of money to spend more of it in that way. Um, with regard to the uh, privacy side of things and the legal side, the question is harder, but I have a kind of feeling that technology may be able to help here as well, that in particular the blockchain is basically ready-made to improve and further you know, strengthen the anonymization of data, which is a huge amount of what these legal restrictions are all about. Uh, okay, just, um, yeah, I, I have many answers, but I'm only uh, uh, asking questions here. Just uh, one uh, remark that I forgot. Uh, here in France, I said it already uh, that uh, two days ago, uh, I think, but here in France at the moment, when you are going to uh, the pharmacy and you are a French citizen, you give your money to the big American company, Igvia. You don't know about it. Well, theoretically, you know. And this uh, big company is after that selling you data to scientists and, uh, well, and one uh, personal opinion uh, for me, it would be a little bit more logical that uh, this data coming from public source and coming from citizens would be uh, not sold by an American company, uh, but uh, given to all scientists who, who want it. Uh, no, the second, uh, the second question is uh, my conviction is uh, that what we need the most at the moment uh, is to, uh, um, to do two things, uh, to, to do two things and not to think about it. Uh, the first one is to start uh, uh, um, experiments on mice uh, old enough, 18 months uh, old, uh, uh, with a control group uh, and to see uh, really when they die and not to kill them after a few weeks uh, to, to, to see their, uh, how they are. Uh, so you spoke about that already, uh, Obwe, so I think uh, you, well, I suppose we all agree about this here, but if you don't agree, just say no, I, and otherwise it's not necessary. And I think the, the second uh, aspect is to start uh, also really um, clinical trials with uh, people uh, informed volunteers old enough and uh, the good thing is nobody is uh, proposing to kill them after a few weeks uh, well almost nobody um, so um, uh, I would say what would be your trip to be able to start that uh, uh, fast in your uh, respective countries let's say well, Obey, you have two respective countries, I think. But uh, yeah, so let's begin with uh, Brenda. So um, in Africa, um, even though I'm based in South Africa, Afro Longevity is looking at um, the whole of Africa, and I'm working with a, a, a brilliant philosopher called Osi Osinagachi Akumagalu. He's from Nigeria, and we've got uh, a few other officers across the African. Uh, continent that uh, we want to work with. Um, one of the key things that we are doing is to work with um, organizations um, 
you know, in the so to, to work with the civil society. So be it entrepreneurs in the different communities. Um, and, you know, I've got my Moira Allen here. Um, she works with, you know, an organization that looks after the needs of older people and all of that. Uh, so I'm mentioning this because coming back to your question, it's about do those people know what is involved? Do they know about longevity and the intervention? Because one thing you don't want to do is just to come and say, we want to include you in this clinical trials. Uh, I mean, we've seen specifically in Africa with, with, with COVID where people were saying no to vaccines because they were saying, you know, you want to use Africans as guinea pigs. So understanding becomes very important and not the same blanket approach to everybody. So going to those community, understanding their needs and understanding the way that you can communicate them in the language that they understand. And by language, I'm not saying Zulu versus uh, Igbo language or whatever the case might be, but do they understand what you are saying and the message um, there? Yeah, um, so very briefly to augment what I've already said about mouse experiments, um, there has been a program in the US uh, focusing on mouse lifespan uh, without killing the mice after a few weeks um, for quite some time, for about 20 years actually. Um, uh, but this program has three major failings. Um, it is called the Interventions Testing Program. It, first of all, f does not focus on late onset interventions. Most of the interventions are done starting early in life. Secondly, it does not mainly focus on combinations of interventions, which is absolutely vital for any approach that um, we have much chance of making a big impact with. And the third thing is that it focuses only on things that can be, can be um, put into the diet rather than things that have to be injected, like stem cells and so on. Um, there are, I, I'm aware of three new research programs that are getting going to um, be a little more courageous in this area, and they are being more courageous in terms of uh, late onset and in terms of uh, comb combining therapies, but unfortunately they're not being any more courageous when it comes to the type of intervention that is uh, used. So our project is grasping that nettle and going all the way to fixing all three of these problems. Um, in the, uh, in, uh, in the question of clinical trials, I think it's very important to uh, recognize that the clinical trials do not have to be the standard, you know, placebo-controlled, double-blinded um, uh, thing in order to get quite a lot of information. That is still the gold standard, and we definitely want more of these things, but they're very, very expensive, and you know, so many of them are going to be done. But we also have the opportunity to essentially follow the self-experimentation um, um, paradigm that, of course, has been uh, highlighted very strongly by Liz Parrish and a few other people like Steve Perry over the past few years, and which is really gathering momentum in the right way, namely in a manner where people who want to be early adopters of experimental technologies actually... Um, you know, get proper measurements of their uh, metabolism and so on at baseline and, you know, do all the measurements that scientists would want them to do in order to maximize the amount of information that is obtained from each individual and thus also the amount that can be extracted by aggregating all of that data. Okay, so, so our party is, is not about, uh, it's about developing the therapies first and uh, we are not at the clinical trial level yet with our demands. Okay. So we just demand more research institutes and, and that more scientists are educated so that the medicine is developed. And of course, it, it would help if, if we would have like a, a trial um, that, that shows that this, this works for rejuvenation, like with, with aging clocks or so. This would uh, help a lot with the advocacy because more, more people would see that it could work if we have small successes. So, well, maybe just a, a technical point uh, of information why uh, mice of uh, 18 months uh, old and not other animals. Uh, just because uh, a mice or rat lives in average about three years. So a mice of 18 months, it's about uh, like a human 
of uh, 60 years old. And so this means even if there was, uh, even if uh, mice were uh, as concerned, uh, as uh, important as humans, we should use uh, uh, mice because it's, uh, yeah. No, not only. Well, 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 okay, uh, I will. I will maybe ask uh, before uh, going to the uh, uh, to the to the room, and we have a lot of time for this. That's great. Um, I will ask uh, uh, my last two questions directly, and and also you you will answer. Uh, so. Um, uh, artificial intelligence and longevity. So I'm, I'm always uh, fascinated and I would say negatively fascinated by the fact. So, uh, for example, you are searching something on Google, you can make a mistake and, and uh, it will correct itself, you know. You will uh, you use Deeple uh, for translation and it will correct. But you uh, use you look for data uh, uh, concerning health with automa with some automation automism okay uh, with some computer <laughs> power and uh, the the result is not great. So why and what can we can we do? And the last uh, question, but so we you can combine is uh, what do you think we can can uh, make more than all what we are doing uh, for to to start yeah let's say uh, moonshot projects uh, to start uh, uh, global projects for longevity that's of course the the biggest uh, question uh, let's uh, begin with no maybe uh, obe you answer and you answer to the rest <laughs> okay um, um. Well, so, I mean, the role of artificial intelligence in medical research generally is clearly enormous. Uh, we have, of course, uh, particularly conspicuous examples like uh, AlphaFold, which has now, which has enormously accelerated medical research in general by um, uh, just making certain experiments a lot easier through the uh, prediction of the shapes of proteins. Um, this is just as relevant to longevity research as it is across the rest of medical research and there will be plenty of other examples of the same thing. In longevity research specifically, we have an enormous amount going on now in the private sector with regard to um, drug discovery using innovative um, uh, deep learning methods. Uh, the most uh, high-profile company in that area is, of course, in silico medicine, uh, run by Alex Avronkov, but it's by no means the only one. Nuchido is a very important company in... Um, uh, the UK, which actually a lot of people haven't heard of yet, but they do very innovative things in a slightly different way that is also showing great success in this regard. So, yeah, this is just going to carry on getting bigger and bigger. Um, Didier, you're going to have to remind me what the other question was. Oh, yeah, moonshots. moonshots. Oh, yeah, that's right. Let me just say, um, the, the main thing about mice is not just that they have a short lifespan. The most important thing is that they have been used in medical research for a very long time, which means that we have an enormous, an enormous wealth of data on how to do good experiments on mice. Even if you take a new species in, into the lab and you try to do anything like that, then you first of all have to figure out how to keep them happy, how to make them not like, you know, die of boredom or whatever. And that's not as easy as it sounds. Every, every species is different. Plus, we have such a, a long history of all of this in longevity research that large institutions such as the National Institute of Health have actually um, taken the trouble to grow, to, to make large colonies of mice that they actually take the trouble to uh, you know, keep alive until they get old, and then they can distribute those mice to other groups. So we have actually just bought a thousand mice from Jackson Labs, which we couldn't have done for any other species. And that's actually a really important part of this. Uh, then you were asking about moonshots. How can we accelerate the um, uh, doing more moonshots? Really, I think by encouraging FOMO, fear of missing out. At the moment, we've got a few groups that are really, you know, throwing far more money into this whole space than even a couple of years ago. And especially in the Middle East, uh, and probably most of you know that there's this new initiative from Saudi Arabia, funded by the government, which is putting $1 billion per year into longevity research. It's, you know, the biggest thing, that, the, the biggest single initiative in the world. And a lot of effort is going in already, but there's going to be more, to encourage other Middle Eastern nations to follow suit and to make, uh, for nationalistic reasons. And that's fine with me.
So, um, for me, as far as AI technology is concerned, um, I, I think I am for advancement of technology if it can help science here even better. Um, the only thing is that, you know, I, I have a problem where technology starts to drive process and, you know, we don't have our our objectives defined beforehand to say this is what we would want to get out of technology even as it progresses, it advances and it becomes self-aware and, and it does that. Just so that the, those algorithms d- don't become... You take away or or minimize the bias as much as possible. Ensure that it can gives us give us the result that we are looking for. Um, so I think if if technology is built on good principle, um, then I'm all for AI being um, uh, incorporated into longevity. That's one. And then as far as the low hanging fruits or moonshots to be able to leapfrog this, uh, Aubrey spoke about you know. Um, um, self, um, what's the word? Fear of missing out? <laughs> no, um, the, 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 the self trials. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Self experimentation. Yeah, self experimentation. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, so I think, you know, this one, uh, there's a lot of medical tourism, uh, that is happening outside of Africa. Actually, in Africa, there's a lot of that that is happening. And I think, uh, if I speak for South Africa, that is something that, you know, happens a lot lot without a lot of people knowing about it. Uh, so I think we can encourage some of those things because like I said, in other areas some of these things are legally allowed than in other areas. So we can bring in some of the research that we are not able to bring to life in other developed countries. In other, So I think my ask would be for us to look at other areas and stop just looking at the West and Europe and, you know, start looking at areas like Africa where there might be more opportunities for this. And the biggest thing, funding is very important as far as uh, longevity is concerned. I think as much as there are a lot of funders that are coming up, there's still more money that is required into this thing. So if we can encourage collaboration between um, all of these different sectors and encourage funding into these organizations that are coming up, we can, you know, uh, progress uh, much faster than we have done in the past 20 years. So, so, so I think it's it's essential to to grow the movement because if if more people are interested in this, then uh, more governments will also invest much more money into life extension research. So, because I mean, I mean, governments uh, they care about votes, right? And nobody, if if nobody is really interested in living longer, uh, then they will probably not do much because uh, it doesn't get them re-elected or it doesn't get them more votes. So I think it's essential to, yeah, to do advocacy and everything and um, to get more people uh, excited about this. Well, thank you so much for uh, your presentations. I just have like three questions, one uh, about the social aspect, the, the second about the technical, and then the third is for uh, Aubrey de Grey about your, how you position your work in the transhumanist nebula and what is your opinion about what transhumanists have been doing for decades. The first question about the social dilemma or the social denial of death, to paraphrase, paraphrase the, um, the, the book of the, the Ernest Becker. So how do you see this? cognitive dissonance between from one side people are afraid of like deleting death and aging and from the other side there are people exclaiming how is it possible that with our minds we can ponder the infinite cosmos yet we're housed in these heart pumping breath gasping decaying bodies all right let me start with that all right um because i'm not good at remembering three questions at a time um so um it's like You know, we don't have to persuade everybody that longevity is a good idea. Uh, we just have to persuade enough people so that we can get it done. And once people, and then, you know, people will be persuaded just because it's already there. The difficulty that we have in this movement is 
that, that most movements don't have, technological movements don't have, is that the technology we're talking about don't yet exist. You know, uh, when Pasteur came along and invented, um, and, uh, well, when Jenner came along and invented vaccines, you know, it was, they already existed. And it was just a case of people could see that they were a good thing. Uh, of course, there were examples when things were delayed. Uh, Pasteur was a decade after Semmelweis, and Semmelweis definitely, you know, died an unhappy man uh, without having success in getting his word out. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's the principle. We don't have to persuade everybody. We just have to persuade enough people. Okay, cool. So the last question is about what even... Because David Pierce, he said that um, it should be technically feasible, but also sociologically viable. And even for psychedelics, for example, which is a, like an anti example, uh, we know the like we want to storm heaven, we want to engender paradise on earth, and yet it's not socially acceptable. The last question... Uh, last few days, we have been talking about what Calico did for 10 years, and we had uh, Laurent Alexandre shouting nothing, absolutely nothing. So for you, what, what were the results, the main results of, uh, of your organization? Yeah, Calico is a huge disappointment, uh, you know, and it's all Larry and Sergei's fault. They just didn't set up the organization right, and it ended up you know, being a, basically a waste of money. Um, So, obviously, I, you know, I've always been trying to be at the tip of the spear and to do stuff that almost everybody still thinks is science fiction. Um, and that's where the uh, um, LEV Foundation is positioning itself. You know, the um, uh, uh, David very uh, um, appropriately mentioned um, terminological reappropriation in another context uh, an hour ago. Um, and so the word rejuvenation is probably a big success story in that regard. You know, it used to be reserved for cosmetics 10 or 15 years ago, and now people use it properly. Uh, but that's only the first step. We still have a lot more to do to get... Um, other things like that taken forward. And, um, you know, so my organization is trying to do that, trying to get stuff done. Uh, we've got enough supporters to be able to get uh, big things done already. And obviously, we will intend to get more done as time goes on. Um, I have a, a question about um, the approach that you're taking to life extension. Um, So you are now uh, predominantly addressing um, an increase in longevity through cleaning up the mess, so to speak. And I was wondering, comparing that to kind of getting at the root of the problem, which is genetic interventions, if weighing between these options is a matter of, of practicality, Well, yeah. uh, in fact, the root of the problem is not genetic interventions, because the overwhelming um, majority of the damage, the mess, as you call it, that accumulates and eventually makes us sick is... Um, caused by mechanisms that are non-negotiable genetically. Uh, you know, the number one one is breathing. Breathing is really bad for you. It, um, you know, it is the main source of free radicals, which damage DNA and damage proteins and so on, and cause most of the mess that we see. And um, that can't, we're not. Gonna, we don't want to. We, we're not about to genetically engineer ourselves not to have to breathe. That's a bit of a tall order. So you know, I would say that from a pr practical perspective, but also uh, from a like exclusivity perspective, uh, cleaning up the mess is the only practical way to go. James, <clears throat> in uh, the bioethics community. There's two ideas that I think have been proposed that would be transformative for uh, pursuing longevity research. One, and I'm just curious about your ideas about the relative importance of them. One is the redefinition of aging as a disease process, um, which could theoretically uh, allow clinical research in, in that field. And the other um, is the use of biomarkers, human biomarkers of aging. And um, I, I guess the I'm interested in your opinions as well about the um, – I'll, I'll, I'll leave the biomarkers of aging to Aubrey, but I'm interested in everybody's opinion about whether redefining aging as a disease process is going to be transformative or not. I, I remember this question uh, was posed by Jose when he attended our conference in August, um, and it got… It's behind you. Behind you. Oh. Oh, yeah, that conference. <laughs> so uh, it got everybody in the room shook 
because you know why don't we define it as aging so our approach is quite um sensitive to what people understand and what people are able to consume and also take into consideration the maturity level in terms of understanding some of these concepts. So we are not going to get up right now when we are still trying to introduce longevity as a concept to people and say now defined aging as it is. We need to still go through the process of making sure that this awareness, this understanding what do we mean when we say you know declare aging as a disease, what does it mean to the work that is being done? You know, it's, it's for us, it's going to be a slow process and, you know, uh, an approach that will ensure that we get buy-in, not immediate defense. Okay, so, so I, th I think it's just uh, semantically. I mean, I think it's not important if you call uh, maybe... Uh, Maybe juristically is important, but um, for, for the for the general public, I think it's not important how we that we call aging a disease, or if we don't call it a disease. Uh, our new strategy is to 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 say to talk about curing aging, so we imply that it is it is a disease. But I think the most important thing is that people understand that. With aging, like damage accumulates and this damage leads to disease. So if you age and you don't do anything, if you don't rejuvenate yourself, you are going to get sick and you are going to get diseases. And how you call it, uh, if you call it now the word aging a disease or it, it doesn't really matter if people understand that, then yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, so, I mean, just to augment what Brenda and Felix said, um, a couple of things. A couple of developments have happened in the past few years, which I believe are enormously important first steps towards solving the problem you're describing. Uh, one of them is what happened at the World Health Organization, where they did fundamentally declare aging a disease, uh, though in a complicated way, uh, but in a very appropriate way. Uh, so now, you know, uh, essentially non-specific, you know, um, Uh, health conditions and decline in function, whether cognitive or physiological, that uh, predominantly affects those who were born a long time ago, is now basically in the international classification for disease. Um, arguably even more important is the other development, which was the definition of the clinical endpoint for a trial of metformin as a general um, postponer of the uh, health conditions of late life. So this was unbelievably difficult to bring about. And I have nothing but congratulations to give to Nir Azalai and the colleagues who negotiated this with the Food and Drug Administration in the USA. The difficulty was not that the Food and Drug Administration didn't want to have a clinical trial of this nature. The difficulty was that the bloody gerontologists couldn't decide on a definition of the word aging. Um, and eventually, Nir and his colleagues cut through that and so the clinical endpoint in that trial, well, that trial hasn't happened yet of course, but the clinical endpoint is a very, very complicated combinatorial thing but it is number one pretty, a pretty good approximation of aging in all but name from the point of view of people like me and number two it is actually well defined as something that can be a yes no binary clinical endpoint for a clinical trial so the FDA is happy with it too everyone thinks the FDA and its colleagues around the world its counterparts around the world are the problem but they are not and so this is a huge breakthrough even though the clinical trial hasn't happened yet that endpoint can be copied and pasted into any other clinical trial that anyone else might want to do for another broad based general postponer of aging but, but it was disease incidence And not biomarkers. Uh, oh, well, right. So this is the point. So this, is, this was nothing to do with biomarkers. So I'll answer the biomarker question now separately. Um, biomarkers for aging have been around a long time, of course, in metabolic forms, you know, things like measuring your insulin resistance or, you know, your grip strength or things like that. And, of course, the thing that gets most of the news these days is epigenetic markers of biological age. Um, however, those epigenetic markers still have a long way to go to be real predictors of biological age that can And be, that can be reliable enough to be predictive, especially predictive in the context of new interventions that 
you know, had not been invented at the time that the clock was developed and therefore were not used in the training set for the clock. Um, we've got a long way to go. But I believe that there's a fair chance that we'll get there in the next few years, and I'm very supportive of the work that's going on, very happy that Altos Labs is putting so much money into it and so on. Um, uh, excellent panel. Congratulations to Brenda, Felix, and Aubrey. Aubrey, because you have to go, and uh, but we take the picture, okay? We have to take the picture. Uh, my question is uh, to prepare for the next uh, panel. The next panel is about cryonics, and you know, cryonics to me is plan B, longevity, and even the I word that I like to say, immortality, is plan A. So can you just say quickly your take on uh, cryonics on preparation for the next panel, please? Sure, yeah, but very briefly. So I've been a, um, a vocal supporter of cryonics for 20 years, ever since I came across it. Um, I've been on Alcor Scientific Advisory Board all that time. Um, but clearly, progress has been far too slow in both selling cryonics to the wider world and, and this is closely linked, of course, in funding and therefore actually getting done research to reduce the amount of damage that is done by cryopreservation. So I'm very pleased that uh, LEV Foundation is funding two projects. One is led by Tanya Jones, who used to be um, CEO of Alcor, and another is led by Alexandra Stoltzing, who used to be my VP of research. Um, and uh, both of these projects are geared towards, in one way or another, allowing us to preserve organs and, of course, including brains and and perhaps whole bodies eventually in a state that is much more revivable just by warming people up rather than by uploading or anything than anything that we can do today. So, yeah, that's my main interest in this area, and I believe that the future is very bright in that regard. Okay, no. oui. <laughs> Euh, au fait, en fait ce n'est pas une question, mais c'est plutôt une, euh, une suggestion. Voilà, c'est par rapport euh, au concept de longétivisme. Euh, par, euh, selon ma petite expérience de terrain, j'ai remarqué que les gens euh, réfléchissent à partir aussi de leur état euh, psychosomatique immédiat. Lorsque quelqu'un est dans la joie et que vous lui dites « vous voudriez-vous vivre pendant 500 ans ?» Il dira « oui, bien sûr ». Mais lorsque quelqu'un est couché dans le lit avec des douleurs que les anti les anti-inflammatoires de troisième, de troisième niveau n'arrivent pas à dompter, il dit « non, je veux mourir ». Parce qu'ils se projettent dans leur, ils projettent leur état actuel immédiat dans la, dans la durée. Voilà, donc je, pour cela, je, euh, je, je suggère qu'il y ait plus de pédagogie dans l'usage du, du concept de l'objectivisme et aussi qu'on prenne toujours le temps de l'accompagner avec en bonne santé. Yeah, so it, it's worse than what you say. It's not only that people look at their own current health, it's look at, they look at their expectation of their future health. And of course, they base that expectation on today's technology. They assume that increasing lifespan will not be associated with increasing healthy lifespan, which is completely wrong. And despite all the efforts that I and others have put in over the years trying to educate the world to understand that this is all about keeping people healthy, not keeping people alive, and that longevity is simply a side effect of health, uh, you know, it's still a very uphill battle to make that actually be understood. You want to say anything, Brenda? Yeah, well, actually, it would not be, it would not be enough 100 uh, seconds to say something about the company. So I would uh, have this privilege to uh, ask the question to Mr. Aubrey. Uh, you said that uh, we don't need to convince everybody to, uh, to be transhumanists, but we need to have enough people. And yesterday, privately, we talked and you said that uh, the wealthy people, they are owners of their money and they have the right to do with their money whatever they want. So uh, since they have uh, enough knowledge, enough, uh, enough uh, funds to finance the whole longevity movement and they don't do so, and considering the previous uh, statements, uh, so uh, what would be your step-by-step -step plan by convincing more and more influential people to finally invest in longevity, otherwise other than uh, something less significant because the longevity will make the people living longer and other things will not. So what would be your step-by-step -step plan on that? Well, some people are more educatable than others. So, and sometimes it takes time. Um, you know, I, I think my microphone has stopped working. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, 
for example, as I said, Larry, Brin, Larry, Larry, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, you know, had all the information they needed to know how to do Calico right, and they fucked it up. And, um, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, took 15 years from the point where I introduced him to all of the damage repair concept and so on uh, before he actually started to uh, put proper money in. So he got there eventually, but it took him 15 years. Um, some people are much faster, like um, Vitalik Buterin, uh, you know, read my book when he was 14. And as soon as he had significant money to burn, he started giving it to Science Research Foundation. Um, and various other people in the blockchain world have done the same. One thing that we need is people who lead by example and who get out and say something about their example. So I want to give a shout out to another not so well known uh, big hitter in the crypto world, a guy named James Fickle, who uh, gave substantial amounts of money to uh, to me and Science Research Foundation and also to other organizations, but who also took the trouble to go out and um, evangelize among his friends who were even bigger hitters. And that has resulted in, you know, eight digit, nine digit sums coming in from the crypto to a community. The same thing actually happened in the case of Bezos. It wasn't just me, it was also another billionaire, um, Yuri Milner, who caused this to actually happen. So, you know, getting people to lead by example is an enormous part of this. Yeah, but this all the drops in the, in the, in the, in the huge not sea. Really, not really. I mean, we've got a, yes, it's only a minority of the world's billionaires, but actually it's about half of the world's top 10 billionaires. So, you know, we're doing pretty well. Okay, and the last question, uh, don't, don't you think that uh, the most, uh, um, how, you, how, you go, uh, how you say, uh, promising solution is in, in longevity is mind transfer? What do you think about it? I don't think it's promising at the moment. I, well, I don't think it's as promising as straightforward, boring damage repair, simply because we know so very little about how to do it. Uh, you know, we have virtually no information about whether it's even possible in principle. So I'm all for research in that area. But as of now, the my, 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 my bet is very firmly on boring damage repair, the wet way of doing things. Aubrey, there is another alternative to damage repair, which was briefly touched on by an earlier question, which is there might be some way of figure, fiddling with our genetics. And you pointed out, well, there's damage caused all the time by our metabolism. But there are at least some people in Altos labs who do seem to think that a uh, the accumulation of damage in the epigenome is so regular, so predictable, that it can't just be to random factors. There must be some programming going on there. And if they, they're searching for a way to undo that programming or even to stop that programming. So do you think they're just uh, whistling in the dark or would you encourage them at least to have a diversity of exploring in case there could be a master switch, which some people fantasize about and uh, are hopeful they'll find it would cause that damage and maybe afterwards cause lots of other repair mechanisms? Because if that was improved, maybe the other damage repair mechanisms which we have when we're young might keep going longer and healthier. So I'm actually not aware that anybody in Altos Labs uh, actually believes all that nonsense. Um, I think that uh, every, 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 almost every uh, credential gerontologist understands that even though many of these things look as though they are programmed, they are not actually programmed. That is merely a side effect of how evolution has got us this way. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, the technologies that we have at the moment for doing anything to restore the epigenetic state of cells to how they were at a younger chronological or biological age is very very, very, very primitive at this point. And in particular, it is indiscriminate. It is applied across the board to all cells and to the whole genome of all cells in a manner that is, of course, derived from what happens naturally in the fertilized egg, uh, where very differentiated um, uh, genomes from the gametes, from the sperm and eggs, are um, essentially wiped clean into the uh, state that they need to be in in order to give rise to the eventual organism. And we definitely need something a very great deal more sophisticated than simply doing that indiscriminate thing a little bit, which is what partial reprogramming currently is, far more sophisticated if we are to get anywhere by restoring the epigenome in what, what would really be a, um, a practical way without having a lot of unintended consequences. Okay. 
So uh, I don't know if you already mentioned this uh, in the previous two days, but uh, this very weekend uh, in a castle uh, 150 kilometers southeast of Paris, the Foresight Foundation, it's organizing yeah. its uh, Foresight Weekend. And um, so uh, it's uh, 500 euros entrance. So uh, and there is also a reason from uh, fightaging.org who is going to talk on the um, on the uh, rejuvenation part and uh, when you look on the on the website you see that for donors above uh, 5000 euro they have this uh, uh, personal uh, foresight patrons uh, longevity program group so i know that you have been uh, at this uh, at these weekends the previous year so my question is do you know and can you share with us what is reason uh, telling these people <laughs> what is in this uh, personal uh, longevity uh, i can guess obviously I've, obviously i've known reason for 20 years um reason is very much persuaded and has very for a very long time been persuaded of the damage repair paradigm that uh, the general that general way to go of course he is now also the ceo of a company that is working on one aspect of damage repair very important one uh, getting rid of oxidized cholesterol uh, so i imagine he will be talking about that i uh, i mean really uh, the thing about reason is we're lucky because he basically says everything he thinks in writing on his website so you can find it out that way and i honestly don't think that that's what people are paying the five thousand dollars to find out Uh, wh what do you think about uh, DeepMind AlphaFold? Oh, well, um, I just mentioned AlphaFold earlier on. It's an absolutely, you know, incalculable benefit to medical research in general, and of course, so uh, therefore also to longevity research. This is, you know, the, the protein folding problem has been foremost among, on people's minds in medical research for decades and decades, and essentially no progress was made until AlphaFold came along. I don't know whether AlphaFold in its latest version is actually participating in the latest of this, this, this competition that happens every two years that it um, wiped the floor with everybody at two years ago, but that's happening right now. I think it may be just over. And I, I am very eager to see what they've been able to do with, for example, um, proteins that are bound to their cofactors or to their substrates, uh, with proteins that are in multi-protein complexes. These are things which AlphaFold, as of two years ago, did not really attempt to be good at. Uh, but I've been a good friend of Demi Hassabis for about 20 years, it turns out, because he, um, he and I were both at Cambridge. And um, uh, knowing him as I do, I have a feeling he's probably going to be showing off some big improvements very soon. Um, thank you. I have a question for Brenda and for Aubrey. As one of the oldest living people in this room, I think... <laughs> I want to know to what extent your advocacy includes the role of the, all these older people, because at the moment we've got a huge problem of ageism. We don't have a role. We've got a whole sector of population that sort of suddenly goes on retirement and then falls off a cliff. And that just cannot attend it because if you have more and more and more and more of us, it's just ridiculous. Um, so, so I'll take this before Aubrey uh, gives you his his view on this. Um, as I said, uh, with Afro longevity, we want to be inclusive and um, touch on all sectors of society, um, older people included, people uh, that uh, are marginalized, so to say, people living with disability, people that are in rural areas. We want to make sure that the knowledge and the awareness is created among all of that because the objective is that as research progresses and all of these solutions comes to the fore, those people are the people that are going to benefit from this. I mean, I was listening to what uh, um, the people in when I attended Transmission Madrid last week, they were talking about uh, preservation and all of that. And, you know, when I, when I, when I listen to the numbers uh, that you cite and some of the people that are there, I mean, those, they, those are the ideal people to understand what's involved in that whole process. Maybe they can benefit from that. So with our advocacy, 
policy and the type of research that we want to do, we really want to get older people involved, younger people involved, uh, because I think it is out of this diversity that we can find uh, something rich that can benefit longevity. Yeah, um, so, you know, I I think ageism is the critical thing that we need to look at here because we're all against ageism. Everybody, nobody actually stands up and says, yes, I am a proud ageist, you know. And the word was invented by the first head of the NIA, Bob Butler, uh, 50 years ago, right? So there's no excuse for ageism. But if we're honest, the fact is that societies neglect for and underfunding of research into longevity, into postponing the health problems of late life, is the single most ageist thing that society does, right? So what's, what's wrong? Why are we doing this? I think that ultimately the answer is it's all the fault of the elderly themselves. The elderly just bloody don't complain enough. You know, if, you know it's age, our field is unique in all campaigns for uh, welfare of, of the disadvantaged, in that the victims of, the, of that particular problem don't complain enough. And, of course, that comes back to what uh, one of the questioners said earlier, that, you know, the more your quality of life goes downhill, the more you lose the will to live. Uh, you know, if people could just see past that, or even just think about, you know, the humanitarian imp- imperative to improve the prospects of other people. That would at least help. But it's a very, very hard battle to win. Okay, thank you. And uh, last but not least question. Oui, alors vraiment, j'ai été, la question à Aubrey Degré, j'ai été surpris et je ne comprenais pas pourquoi l'échec de Calico. Alors que nous, bon, quand je parle de, de marché d'augmentation en Afrique, dans plusieurs conférences que j'ai pu faire, je signale que et le marché d'augmentation, notamment de prolonge, prolongement de la vie, est ouvert. Et lorsque, depuis euh, vendredi, c'était d'abord Laurent Alexandre qui l'a dit rapidement, je bon, n'ai pas insisté, mais vous le confirmez là, au vrai degré, Qu'est-ce que, qu'est-ce que vous pouvez conseiller à ceux qui en Afrique aimeraient bien introduire, comme le fait déjà euh, Brenda en Afrique du Sud avec son association, mais est-ce que l'éducation doit aller dans le sens de ce que vous dites que ceux, bah, la vieillesse, ceux qui sont assez âgés, qui doivent se plaindre, ne se plaignent pas Alors, est-ce qu'il y a un problème à venir leur dire, mais vous avez un problème, vous, euh, il faut que vous intéressez à ça Comme disait justement euh, pour, pour lui qui est à côté des malades qui travaillent dans le domaine de la santé, il se dit, ceux qui sont déjà assez âgés et qui ont des problèmes, euh, c'est pas à eux qu'il faut aller demander de, de, de prolonger leur vie et, et maintenant est-ce qu'il faut donc avancer revenir à ceux qui pensent qu'ils ont encore beaucoup de vigueur et, et qui sont des jeunes est-ce qu'il faut la, l'éducation peut-être devrait commencer plus tôt parce qu'effectivement là je comprends que euh, quand on est déjà dans cet âge avancé et eh ben oui on demande à finir ses jours et, et surtout en Afrique nous beaucoup croient que la véritable longévité c'est dans le retour on vit plusieurs vies et on va et on revient Voilà. Enfin, maintenant, j'aimerais avoir votre réaction à ça. Merci. Okay, so first, very quickly about Calico. The problem with Calico was is purely structural. The um, problem is that Larry and Sergey, when they put it together, they had a very fixed idea of what kind of structure they wanted to put together. First of all, they just don't believe that non-profits can do anything efficient in in technology. And no, other people think that too. Uh, so you can't do anything about that. But then, you know, they didn't recognize that the job they wanted to do required a sequence of three separate skill sets. First of all, uh, they you need basic science, discovery of um, ways that you might get something to work. So that's like going from um, the, the statement of the problem to the concept. Then step two is going from the concept to the proof of concept. So that's the early stage technology. And then the third step is going from the proven concept to a product. And they hired the best possible CEO 
um, Art Levinson to do step three. He used to run a huge biotech company called Genentech. He ran it fantastically well. He's the right person for the job. And then he hired the absolute right person for step one, a fantastic basic scientist named David Botstein, um, who, you know, has had a, a hugely illustrious career. Unfortunately, neither Art nor David understood anything about aging, and so they didn't realize that they hadn't hired anyone for step two, like to get from concept to proof of concept. And that's, so there's this enormous internal valley of death in, in Calico. And that's why they will never, except possibly by accident, do anything of any significance other than just, you know, in licensing something that's already been developed and like restricting themselves to step three. Um, coming back to your, the rest of your question, um, well, I mean, in brief, let me just say that you're completely right. Education, especially education of younger people, is absolutely key. The problem with younger people at the moment is that they have the opposite problem from what the older people have. The older people have given up on the idea that anything can possibly happen to help them to be in time for them. But younger people, conversely, take the view that it's all going to be okay by the time it matters for them. You know, people are going to have fixed the problem. They don't need to do anything to speed it up. Um, so one of the things that makes me happiest about Afro Longevity is that um, uh, Brenda and OC have firmly, uh, uh, you know, emphasized the role of education as primary among their activities going forward. I think that's absolutely the correct thing to do. Thank you, Aubrey. So, and now it is time for the group picture. Uh, but before, thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah.